Vincent Brown and welcome to Egg Francis, a monthly book club about art and artists. For each episode, I will address a specific work of fiction or nonfiction that covers a specific period in our history or covers the life of an artist or group of artists. What makes this book club unique is that I provide images of paintings and places to provide a visual context for each book. Essentially, the podcast takes two approaches to telling a narrative one inspired by the author, the other created by me in the form of a visual presentation that when combined offers a unique synthesis of text and imagery. For this first episode, I will focus on the life and art of Peter Paul Rubens, the book that will serve as the inspiration and a book that I hope you all will read if you haven't already is Mark Lamster's The Master of Shadows, The Secret Diplomatic Career of the Painter Peter Paul Rubens. Lamster's book covers his diplomatic career, including various relationships that Rubens formed with kings, dukes, and dignitaries, as well as the great commissions and relationships that he would form out of those connections. So let's begin. Uh, what, what you're looking at here on the left is an image of Vincenzo Gonzaga, who was first mentioned in the book. He was the Duke of Mantua, who was preparing to send gifts to King Philip, the Duke of Lerma, and his minister, John Rodrigo Calderon. And as an unlikely choice, Gonzaga chooses Rubens to be his courier. Now, in the normal conditions, as the book stipulates, Diplomatic work was reserved primarily for members of the aristocracy, and artists were considered craftsmen uh, of a much lower status. So why Rubens? It's not quite certain, but in the book, the author provides some reasons for choosing Rubens. One, he spoke several languages. Two, he had a thorough grounding in classical literature, so he could converse with anyone. He was a perfect gentleman, and he was a talented painter which could come in handy when delivering paintings that could possibly be damaged during travel and he could easily retouch them. The author also provides some background information on Rubens, including his education and artistic training. For example, during his formative years as a painter, Rubens worked as an apprentice for three artists, Adam Van Noort on the left, who was Dean of the Guild of St. Luke. Tobias Verhecht, top right, who was also a painter active in Antwerp, and Otto van Veen, a painter and humanist who worked out of Antwerp and Brussels. And it would be from those three apprenticeships that Rubens would learn the basics of his craft. Like many artists during this period, Rubens longed to travel to Italy to study directly from the great Italian masters. He received his official papers from the Antwerp Town Hall to travel on May 8, 1600, and his first stop was Venice. There he was able to see the works of Tintoretto and Titian featured on the top and bottom right. The Venetian influence will become prominent features in his work later on, employing the use of dynamic compositions and expressive brushwork. To the left is an early painting by Rubens titled Adam and Eve, painted in 1597, a year before he joined the Guild of St. Luke. The painting reveals his command of the human figure, but as you can see, it lacks the fluidity and confidence of his more mature works. This early relationship that Rubens established with Vincenzo Gonzaga would turn out to be an important one because it would lay the foundation for his diplomatic career. In the book, the author indicates that Rubens accompanied Gonzaga to the proxy marriage of Marie de Medici to Henry IV of France, which was held under the soaring vault of Brunelleschi's dome in Florence. The painting that you see on the right is actually a painting that Rubens painted much later as part of the Marie de Medici cycle, arguably one of Rubens' best commissions. Lamster proceeds with his investigations into Rubens' diplomatic career by providing historical background, including specific incidents related to Rubens' family life. Charles V, seen on the left, organized the Low Countries 
into a loose federation of 17 provinces, which left them with a certain degree of autonomy as reflected in the Augsburg Transaction of 1548. This dynamic began to change, however, when Philip II took over, implementing harsher measures to discourage resistance to the Spanish crown and to Catholicism. Opposed to the Inquisition and the king's enforcement of the rules of the Council of Trent as they impacted the people of the Low Countries was William of Orange, pictured on the left, who helped to put together a petition that was sent to Margaret of Parma in Brussels to readdress those issues. There was a temporary acquiescence to beggar demands, but harsher actions would follow. For example, in order to quell resistance in the Low Countries, the Duke of Alba was ordered by Philip II to institute a secret court called the Council of Troubles, a tribunal that pronounced death sentences for rebels. There were many death sentences, so many in fact that the courts became known as the Council of Blood. Lamster also provides information about Peter Paul Rubens's father, Jan Rubens, which becomes an important thread in this story as far as understanding the path that Rubens' life would eventually take. Pictured here is Anna of Saxony on the bottom right, who is the wife of William of Orange. Anna hired Jan Betts, a legal advisor, to help reclaim personal assets that were seized by the Spanish crown as a result of Orange's exile. Assisting Jan Betts was Jan Rubens, who, during the course of offering their services, became involved in an affair with Anna. Anna would later bear his child, and once this became public, Rubens was jailed in a Dillenburg prison. His wife, Maria Rubens, sent numerous requests to have her husband released, but Jan Rubens remained in prison until Anna's death in 1577. Coincidentally, Peter Paul Rubens was born the same year. The Archduke Albert of Austria, Philip's nephew, and the Infanta Isabella, seen here, were eventually given the title of the Spanish Netherlands in the late 1500s as a wedding present. When Philip II died in 1598, the crown was assumed by his younger brother, Philip III. With very little interest in the Netherlands, Philip employed the Duke of Lerma to assume the responsibilities. From this point onward, Albert and Isabella and the Duke of Lerma would be important contacts for Rubens' evolving diplomatic career, his commissions as a painter, and the impact these figures would have on decisions affecting his homeland. The diplomatic career of Rubens' career figures prominently in the book, and this is what gives Lamster's book its special charm and interest for the reader. Yet there are sections in the book where Rubens' personal life is also emphasized. For example, the books make reference to Peter Paul Rubens' brother, Philip Rubens, who was a councilman with considerable authority. He married a woman by the name of Marie de Moy in 1609, and the wedding ceremony provided the context for Rubens' own love affair, the 18-year-old niece of his brother's bride, Isabella Brandt, who he married later that year. On the left, to commemorate the occasion, Rubens painted this disarmingly intimate double portrait of himself and his young bride, with the couple seated in complimentary outfits beneath the bower of honeysuckle. On the right is a later portrait drawing of Isabella, now in the British Museum, dated 1621. Albert and Isabella appointed Rubens as their court painter in 1609, which enabled him to remain in Antwerp, offering him a container of 500 florins. This also freed him from paying taxes to the Guild of St. Luke. In addition to the patronage of Albert and Isabella, Rubens received commissions from Antwerp's political merchant elite, resulting in his first major commission celebrating the Twelve Years' Truce. As the author writes, Ruben responded with his most ambitious work to date, with an enormous painting of the Adoration of the Magi. The Twelve Years' Truce was the name given to the cessation of hostilities between the Habsburg rulers of Spain and the Southern Netherlands and the Dutch Republic as agreed in Antwerp on April 9, 1609. In this work, the Virgin, the guardian of Antwerp, 
presents a baby Jesus symbolizing peace to three visiting kings representing Spain, the Dutch, and the Archdukes. During the period of the Twelve Years' Truce, Rubens erected more than 60 altarpieces, a third for churches in Antwerp. Later, when Rubens would visit Philip IV in Spain, he would find this painting languishing in the basement of the Alcazar. Among the changes he made at this time, Rubens would insert a donkey on the bottom right who is looking away from the scene, possibly intended to be a veiled commentary on those who turned their backs on the peace process. Rubens' studio became prolific with numerous assistants to handle large-scale output. Rubens was also a great collaborator, surrounding himself with talented artists specializing in a range of genres. The most renowned of his assistants was Anthony Van Dyke, featured on the left. Rubens collaborated with others on numerous paintings, including his earliest known collaboration with Jan Brugel the Elder in a painting titled Battle of the Amazons, top right. The elder and more experienced Brugel likely initiated the compositions and also painted the landscape. The 21-year-old Rubens painted the figures inspired by drawings after antique and Renaissance models and used charging horses to emphasize the drama. Another famous collaborator was Franz Snyder, as exemplified in the example at the bottom right of a painting titled Prometheus Bound, dated 1611. Rubens often assembled with a group of like-minded citizen scholars in private galleries known as Kunstkammers, which were added as extensions onto their homes. Rubens became known as an avid collector and made numerous copies of other paintings by well-known artists like Titian Veronese and Tintoretto. The book points out several instances where Rubens entered into deals to acquire vast collections from others outside of Antwerp, including the priceless collection of marbles from Dudley Carlton, the English statesman and diplomat. The image you're looking at here is reminiscent of the, the kind of studio or art gallery that you would have seen in Antwerp, like the ones that Rubin owned. Now, this is actually a painting by William Van Hecht, which is an image of the Van de Geest home, with Rubens addressing the Archdukes Albert and Isabella in 1628. I think all of us would agree that the most memorable feature of Rubens' work are the fleshy female nudes in The Rape of Leucippus, dated 1617, and Perseus Rescuing Andromeda, 1622, Rubens begins to recognize the power of the female nude as a medium for conveying visual pleasure and symbolic meaning, and specifically involving paintings that often allude to meanings that are not apparent on the surface. When you look at the two paintings featured here, they can very well be read as allegories for the flight of Flanders with helpless matings representing careworn homelands and armor-clad heroes, the forces of Spain. As mentioned earlier, when Rubens first began his diplomatic missions for Vincenzo Gonzaga, in 1622, Rubens traveled to the Luxembourg Palace at the invitation of Marie de' Medici to paint a cycle of paintings for a new palace on the left bank by the Seine. It was also by this time that Rubens remained in regular communication with the Infanta Isabella as one of her most entrusted advisors. The Marie de' Medici cycle would become one of his grandest commissions. Among the paintings included the education of the princess, the disembarkation at Marseille, and the presentation of a portrait to Henry IV. As the author echoes throughout the book, the political ramifications of Rubens' diplomatic missions were enormous and had deeply personal significance for him in regards to the future relationship of Spain to Flanders. Spinola, the famous Italian general serving the Spanish crown, was a recognized war hero who was aware of Rubens' diplomatic missions to promote peace between the regions. As a result, Spinola exercised considerable restraint at this time. Yet when Dutch forces seized a port in the Brazilian colonies, Spinola was compelled to take action and launched a major offensive laying siege to the fortified Dutch city of Breda. This was a major victory for Spain, a moment that was memorialized in the painting by Velazquez, The Surrender of Breda, 
1635. As Spinola was preparing to argue the case against the French alliance before Philip and the Count Duke of Alaveres, he was preparing to travel with Don Diego Messia, chief minister to Philip IV, who was to become his future son-in-law. Before they departed from Flanders, Rubens received a visit from them at his Antwerp home to discuss politics and to paint portraits of the two soldier diplomats. In the book, Lamster provides a description of this sitting. On a thick sheet of cream paper, Rubens set up a faint grid of regulating lines and began the quick work of drafting the marquise in black and white chalk. Beneath the head of unruly hair, he sketched Messia casting a forbidding, almost cruel glance at some unseen subordinate off to his right. When the owners were satisfied, he went over it with more chalk, adding a bit of red for color and black ink for emphasis. In the finished painting that followed, Messia stands ramrod, straight in a gleaming suit of armor. King Philip IV, who at this time had very little respect for Rubens, mainly because he was outside the realm of royalty and not a member of the aristocracy, ordered the Infanta Isabella to retrieve all of Rubens' correspondences with Gerbier and Buckingham regarding any peace talks with England. When it was discovered that many of the correspondences were written in code, Philip summoned Rubens to Spain. When Rubens arrived in Spain, he presented the king with a group of paintings, one of which included the reconciliation of Jacob and Esau, which was a subtle allusion to Philip and Charles. When Rubens arrived in Spain at the Real Alcazar, he shared a studio with Velazquez, who he became friends with, and painted several portraits of Philip reminiscent of the equestrian portraits he painted for Lermer and Buckingham. Philip was so pleased with his portrait that he decided to install it opposite Titian's Charles V at Mulberg, displacing the equestrian portrait by Velazquez. The relationships he cultivated with Philip IV and Oliveres enhanced his role as diplomat and painter. Upon leaving Spain, Rubens headed for England to continue negotiating the peace process. He worked on two paintings for the collection of Charles I. In Allegory of Peace and War, represented here, Minerva is represented as wisdom and restrains a war guide bent on destruction of innocence and property. Rubens also painted St. George and the Dragon, a subject matter that Charles I was particularly fond of, having already owned a painting of the same subject matter by Raphael. The crowning artistic glory of Rubens' stay in London was the ceiling of the banqueting house at Whitehall. The project developed in close collaboration with Indigo Jones, top right, who was the architect for the building. The painting consisted of a rectangular grid of nine paintings celebrating the career of James I, Charles's father. The inspiration for the ceiling was Veronese's own ceiling for the church of San Sebastiano in Venice. Before Rubens departed for Antwerp, he was knighted with a diamond-studded hatband and a ring strayed from the king's finger. The ceiling celebrated British unity, but Charles's disdain for Parliament brought on the English Civil War. In January 1649, he was beheaded directly in front of the banquet house. In the last chapter, it was apparent that Rubens did not leave England on a high note. He did, however, resume matters of a more personal concern. When he returned to Antwerp, he married 16-year-old Helen Forment on December 6, 1630. Helen was the daughter of a respected tapestry dealer. In the book, Lamster provides a detailed description of just how powerful her influence would become in the paintings during the post-1630 period. As he writes in his later works, she became an exhaustible wellspring of his art. Hers was the face that launched a thousand paintings and her body countless more. The new was Rubens' great metier and she had the kind of ample figure he had always liked to paint. Fleshy and pink in its overwhelming erotic abundance, she was the walking model of his vision of Baroque splendor and he ravished her on canvas, luxuriating in her body's every crease, dimple, swell, and curve. Now all of his paintings of her were explicitly erotic. 
Rubens also depicted his young wife in the finest silks, draped in fur and strolling about the garden of their Antwerp home. Some of the paintings that Helen would figure prominently in were Rubens and his wife, Helen Forment, Portrait of Helena Forment, The Feast of Venus, The Three Graces, and The Judgment of Paris, considered to be his final work. And now I would like to conclude my presentation of Mark Lampster's book with a direct quote from Lampster describing one of Rubens' last and greatest masterpieces. As he writes, Rubens' great masterpiece on the theme of violence was his Horrors of War painted in the winter of 1638 as a commission for the Grand Duke of Tuscany. The composition for which he was paid, 142 florins, was derived from the earlier sketch of Mars dragging a female figure, but with significant alterations. At the center of the large canvas, Rubens painted the war god rushing forward with a bloody sword as a nude Venus. One of his most beautiful drapes herself across his body in an effort to restrain him. An architect, protractor in hand, is thrown on the ground, symbolizing the urban destruction that is war's inevitable consequence. Mars treads on a book and paper the sad fate of the arts and sciences. Cowering at the side is a woman with a child in her arms. As Rubens wrote in an explanatory note about the painting, that maternal figure, quote, indicates that fertility, procreation, and parental love are disrupted by war, which ruins and destroys everything, unquote. And it is here where I would like to conclude our discussion of the first book addressing the work of the diplomatic career of Peter Paul Rubens as illuminated by Mark Lamster's The Master of Shadows, The Secret Diplomatic Career of the Painter Peter Paul Rubens. Please follow us on iTunes and leave comments in the iTunes store for feedback and suggestions. I thank you for tuning in. My name is Timothy Brown and I will see you next month for Ekphrasis, a monthly book club about art and artists.